I did uh, have that experience once of uh, starting a sermon and, and, and no notes here and, 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 and went on uh, without the notes and, and then at the door I put my hand in my pocket and there they were. So was, yeah, I, I didn't know how to interpret that uh, providence. Uh, anyway, here we are, notes, notes, notes here and uh, Romans uh, chapter 4 and, and we're thinking uh, of this, this second area <coughs> of being right with God without the sacraments. And, and it's, 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 it's an interesting passage, and, and I hope we can grasp uh, the message of the paragraph uh, as we, we come to think of it this evening. Uh, and the word sacrament uh, uh, it has a, a range of suggestions for where, where it came from. The, the one I like, uh, whether it is the, the most accurate one, is uh, the, the one which uh, interprets the word sacrament from, from the Latin, uh, meaning a sacred vow. And the origin of the term goes back to when commanders or generals would hire soldiers. And not only would they pay them, but they would also extract from them a promise of allegiance. So that the soldier, in the heat of the battle, perhaps that the battle wasn't going the way of the army to which that soldier belonged, wouldn't change sides. So, so the, the commander at the outset uh, giving uh, the, 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 the coin uh, to, to the soldier would extract a promise of allegiance. And, and this fits, doesn't it, uh, the, the, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper because it's always a challenging experience for us uh, to witness baptism, to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're reminded of who our Lord and Master and Saviour is and our commitment to follow him. And so sacrament is a really useful word as we understand it in this sense of a sacred vow, a promise to follow the Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And it's this dominant idea uh, that we find in chapters 9, uh, verses 9 to 12 uh, of chapter 4 in Romans being right with God without the sacraments. So we come to our, our second study of, of thinking about this important subject of being right in our standing with God. Uh, the biblical term for this uh, we know is to be justified negatively. We saw this morning that means forgiven of our sins. Positively, that means declared righteous by God. And the writer in this chapter is, is advocating, defending what he's already argued in chapters 1 to 3, that we are right with God by faith in Jesus alone. He's argued from the experience of Abraham, from reason, and from the experience of David, that we are right with God apart from good works. Abraham was made right with God without good works, David also speaks of being made right with God without good works. The good works of tithing, of church attendance, of kind deeds, of fasting, of praying. They do not contribute. They are not necessary for our salvation in any way before Almighty God. One famous song puts it like this. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. And, and I can't think of that line without thinking of a, 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 an insight into Spurgeon's early preaching. He had, and well, if, if this is an idea that you want to take hold of and, and use, that, that's, that's fine uh, with me. Uh, he had a, a critic in the congregation uh, who wrote to him every week uh, with all his, his, his misspoken words. Uh, and one of the criticisms that he gave Spurgeon was he kept quoting this line in his passionate pleading with sinners to believe in Jesus alone for salvation. And Spurgeon often recited this well-known line, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. And his point was, and the point of this line was, and the point of this chapter is that we are made right with God by faith in Jesus alone. We bring nothing. We contribute nothing. Our hands are empty. Faith is the empty hand that reaches out and lays hold on Jesus. 
But just linger on the point that the, the writer has made in this first paragraph. Abraham made right with God without works. What a point that is. Because you know the story of Abraham. He was declared righteous by God in the 15th chapter. But in the 18th chapter, Abraham took matters into his own hands. He had a wobble in his faith. In chapter 21, he, he lied about the identity of his wife, Sarah, saying she was his sister. Did that impact that declaration of righteousness given by God? Did those failings in Abraham's life make him less righteous, put his standing with God under suspicion or doubt? For our comfort, for our assurance, for our help, no, it did not. But what about David, whom he's just mentioned? David, who, who writes about God not counting any sins against him in verse number eight. What type of sins is he talking about there? What about the big sins? And that's the wonderful help for us as we think of this, that, that David had big sins at that very moment that he writes this. Big sins of murder and adultery. Not the little sins of lust that we find in our hearts. Not the little sins of hate that we find in our hearts. But the, the full grown dimension of those seeds within our heart were, was in his life. The murder, the adultery. But even those big sins. Such is the grace of God. Such is the amazing wonder of the mercy of God that God does not count those sins against us when he declares us righteous in his grace. David did not write these words because he had fasted for 30 days, because he had climbed the Mount of Olives on his bare feet, or because he had gone on some pilgrimage to a far-off land he declared these incredible words about his big sins because of who God was and is. A God of grace who declares righteous everyone, anyone who believes in Jesus. And in this section, the apostle moves on to, to another important area, moving on from, from our works and, and how we don't contribute anything, we don't add to the, the finished work of Jesus. And, and he moves on to this area of, of, the, of the sacraments. And we know from Acts chapter 15 that there were people in the New Testament church in Jerusalem, they were claiming, Jewish Christians, that unless a Gentile was the recipient of this Old Testament sacrament of circumcision, they couldn't be saved. So they were saying, not only does someone have to have faith in Jesus, but they had to have this sacrament as well to, to be saved. So, so this is not some idea which was remote, some idea which the apostle in his ivory tower wanted to wrestle with, with his, in his own mind. But this was a, a live problem, a real issue within the thinking of, of Christians who came from a, a Jewish tradition. You see, their problem, their problem was that, as we saw in Genesis 17, circumcision was given by God. And this is what they were struggling with. How can we stop this God-ordained practice? How can we say we don't need this anymore when God commanded it? I'm going to replace in this sermon, uh, the word uh, sacrament for the word circumcision. In our theology, in our beliefs, uh, we think of two sacraments in the Old Testament, circumcision and the Passover. And in the New Testament, those Old Testament sacraments have been replaced with baptism and the Lord's Supper. And, and so to gain the, the, the practical impact of this for us, uh, to understand uh, the relevance of this for our lives, uh, we uh, see the, 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 the point that has been made here that these sacraments uh, are being spoken of, uh, and the point is 
that we are made right with God by faith without sacraments, whether in the Old Testament sacraments or the New Testament sacraments. And this is an important point. Because in our country, in our province, Roman Catholicism argues that the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are necessary for salvation. At baptism, they argue that a child is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. At communion, they argue the recipient partakes of the very body and blood of Jesus and so receives salvation. So they argue sick infants are baptized in a hospital if they are in danger of dying to ensure their entrance into heaven. They believe that the sacrament of baptism is essential to the salvation of any person. And then they hold mass on a Saturday evening in chapels to allow people to attend mass who are busy on a Sunday so that they can get their salvation. Roman Catholicism argues that the sacraments are necessary for salvation. But this view is also found among some Protestants. A member of the RP Church conveyed to me that he was greatly relieved that the minister got to the hospital to baptize his infant son before he died. That member held the idea that the sacraments were necessary for salvation. Some members in Reformed Presbyterian or Presbyterian churches may be irregular in their attendance throughout the year, but when it comes to communion Sabbath, they are there, driven by this inkling that the sacraments are necessary for our salvation. And so this paragraph is speaking into our time, it's speaking into our country by establishing that we are made right with God without the sacraments. There are only two points. Uh, being made right with God without sacraments proved and then being made right with God without sacraments applied. Let's think first of all of the, the paragraph that's, that's before us here and then we will apply uh, this paragraph to our situation. So the, the, the apostle here in this paragraph, he begins with questions in verses 9 and 10a. And, and there's, there's a, a, a range of questions here, isn't there? He asked, is this blessing, that is the blessing of forgiveness that he's spoken of in verse 8, only for those who, who have the sacrament, who use the sacrament, or is this blessing for, for all? This is his question, and this is the question we're asking. Is the sacraments, are the sacraments necessary for our salvation? So, so he's asking uh, this question here, is the blessing of forgiveness of being declared right with God Tied to the sacraments, do we have to have received them? Do we have to be using them for salvation? And, and, and what a question this is. And, and it's an important question in our society, perhaps in our life uh, and in our mind. And, and once again, he, he appeals to the situation of, of Abraham. He goes back to him uh, and his situation in chapter 15 uh, of the book of Genesis. Uh, and he's asking when was Abraham made right with God or declared right with God? When did that statement occur that Abraham was made right with God by faith in the promises of God? Did it occur when he had the sacrament or did it occur before he had the sacrament? If he was a partaker of the Old Testament sacrament, then legalists could argue, see, there you go. Salvation and the sacrament are tied together, being made right with God and partaking of the sacrament are essential. Or if Abraham was made right with God before he received the sacrament, well, that is significant. That indicates a different understanding and answer that Abraham is made right with God without the sacrament. 
in a criminal investigation, if you're experiencing that yourself, or if you're interested in that, or if you're familiar with those documentaries about that, timelines are really important. This helps them prepare initial theories that this helps them in, in the direction uh, that their investigation uh, w- will, will go along. It helps them in presenting the evidence to the jury. If they can set it out, uh, th- there is Joe Bloggs, the victim. He was last seen at 11.05 joking with the manager of the spar. Then he was never seen after that. The, the timeline it is important in the investigation. And for the apostle, the timeline in Abram's experience is important. When was he declared righteous by God? Was it when he had the the sacrament? Or was it before he had the sacrament? This is the question. And this is the question for us as we think of baptism, as we think of the Lord's Supper. Is it essential for our salvation? We come secondly to the answer in verses 10b and 11. The short answer is given first in verse 10b. It was not after, but before he had the sacrament. So that's a significant point. In fact, the chronology between Genesis chapter 15, where Abraham was declared right with God, and chapter 17, where he received the Old Testament sacrament, was 29 years. So for 29 years, he lived, served, fellowship with God without the sacrament. His fuller answer is in verse 11. That when he received the sacrament, it added nothing to his status before God. It did not contribute to it. It did not elevate it. It did not advance it. It did not refine it. It added nothing to his status before God. Rather, it was a sign and a seal of that declaration of right standing before God, which he had before he received the sacrament. So not only was he made right with God before he received the sacrament, but when the sacrament came along, it pointed back to the righteous standing he had with God before the sacrament was there. It was a sign. It was an outward sign. It was a tangible, visible sign that Abraham was the friend of God, that his sins were forgiven, that he was declared righteous before God. It was a seal of the assurance of God's word, which God spoke within that 17th chapter, that God would be his God, that God would bless him, that God would provide an everlasting kingdom from him. Generally, signs go up after the edifice has begun, don't they? Just look at the nursing home or the edifice just there at the corner of the Port of Ferry Road. Many of us have gone past, is this the new football ground? Is this Marks and Spencer's outlet that's going down there? We've wondered what it is. It seems to be a new nursing home down there, but there's no sign there. They don't want a sign down there yet. The place looks a a shambles. You you can see through the the rafters. The bricks are there. They're going to wait until it's advanced and refined and developed. The sign often comes once the element is established. And so here, Abraham receives the sacrament, the sign of his faith, 29 years after that declaration of righteousness by God. And this, this is, a, this is a, a point for us as we move forward to Saturday. As we think of our new king receiving that, that special anointing, symbolizing, symbolizing the Holy Spirit coming upon him to empower him and enable him to rule well. And what a, 
a wonderful thing it would be if the sign has the reality of it joined together. That not only would there be this shell, not only would there be this sign, but but the reality of, of what the sign points to would be experienced by the king. And what a thing for ourselves is As we think of baptism, whether adult baptism or infant baptism, that sign and the desire for our children, for ourselves, that that what is signified will have a corresponding reality in our life. For Abraham, it was there. The sign, the sacrament coming 29 years after was pointing back to a reality that was in his soul. He was right with God. And so in our experience, the desire is for for all of our covenant children, for for every adult who's received baptism, that the the sign will have the corresponding reality in the life of the subject of baptism. And the, the author then, having asked the question, having answered the question, comes to the conclusion in verse 11b and 12. The purpose The purpose of this, the purpose of bringing this sacrament to Abraham in this state before he had the sacrament was twofold. One was to teach us that the sacrament is not essential for salvation, that the Gentiles there, they didn't have to receive this Old Testament sacrament. They could believe in Jesus And they would be assured of heaven because that was the case with Abraham. For 29 years, he lived without the sacrament. That's one of the lessons that arise from this story of Abraham. And the other lesson is that we shouldn't have the sacrament without the corresponding reality. We shouldn't have baptism or the Lord's Supper without the corresponding reality of saving faith. This is his point here. And to make him, verse 12, the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had. Not only will they have the the, the Old Testament sacrament but they will have the reality that that points to of saving faith. They will not rest in the sacrament. They will not think the sacrament's enough for them to get into heaven. But the corresponding reality which was in Abraham's life will also be in their life of saving faith in Jesus. Can I put it like this? You can have an anorak without a hood. That's fine. Loads of us have an anorak without a hood. And it's, it doesn't look odd. It doesn't look wrong. But you can't really have a hood without an anorak. This is the the double conclusion here. We can have saving faith without the sacraments. But we shouldn't have the sacraments without saving faith. So saving faith is the crucial thing for us. A person can be in heaven without baptism or the Lord's Supper. But if we are baptized, if we do partake of the Lord's Supper, then by God's grace and mercy, saving faith should be in us. Right with God, without the sacraments, first of all, proved. Secondly, right with God, without the sacraments, applied then to our life and to our time. And there's two important applications that that come from this paragraph. Isn't it a tremendous paragraph, a really useful paragraph for us as we think of the sacraments, as we witness baptism, as we think of our own baptism, as we come to communion. And one is to understand how the sacraments are a means of grace to us. If they're not necessary for salvation, well, how then are the sacraments a means of grace to us? Roman Catholicism understands the sacraments as a means of saving grace. 
But we are to understand the sacraments as a means of strengthening grace. They claim the act of baptism, saving grace is communicated to the child, the eating, the bread and the wine, saving grace comes to the recipients. Thus, baptism for, for Roman Catholicism is a means of saving grace. But we are to understand the sacraments as a means of strengthening grace. We recognize the means of grace to be the preaching of God's word, the reading of God's word, the Bible. We recognize the sacraments to be baptism and the Lord's Supper, another means of grace. We recognize prayer as a means of grace. The word, prayer, the sacraments are the three means of grace for the Christian. Not in any robotic or automatic way, but as we prepare for public worship, for our private devotions, for witnessing baptism, for partaking of the Lord's Supper, as we engage in prayer, the Spirit comes down upon us in these moments in the presence of the means of grace and doesn't bring saving grace so much to us, but brings strengthening grace, confirms our understanding of the gospel, assures us of God's grace and love and mercy towards us. We discount the sacraments as a means of saving grace, but we advocate they're a means of strengthening grace. Think of baptism as a means of grace. We believe the Holy Spirit can regenerate a child in the moment of baptism, and that is our prayer but we do not believe that the act of baptism is solidly connected to the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. But baptism is a means of grace to parents reminding them of the covenant promises of God, to the congregation reminding us of our baptism and challenging us in our walk with God. The Lord's Supper is a means of grace assuring us of the love of Christ and the sufficiency of his atonement. We steer away from the sacraments as being a means of saving grace, but we advocate that they're a means of strengthening grace. One writer puts it, preaching is not a powerless human explanation of the biblical text, for the Spirit accompanies it so that God's word achieves its purposes. Prayer is more than empty words. It establishes communion between us and the Creator, thereby empowering us for belief and faithful service. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are not mere memorials that we do simply because Jesus tells us to do them. Rather, we participate with Christ himself by faith. So while the sacraments are not necessary for our salvation and do not contribute to saving faith in any way. Yet they are a means of strengthening our faith. But secondly, how are the sacraments, signs and seals, verse 11? This is the, the terminology which is lifted from verse 11 and used in our church standards that the sacraments are signs and seals for us emanating from verse 11 of Romans chapter 4. Well, they are signs. Baptism with water is a sign for us of cleansing. It's not a guarantee of cleansing, but it's a sign that God in heaven in his infinite mercy and grace forgives and cleanses sinners. When the 1689 Baptist Confession states that baptism is a sign of being engrafted into Christ, it does not mean that this is the case in every instance of a person being baptized. Baptism is a sign. The hope is there, the desire is there, the longing is there, that, that what the symbol is joined to the reality, but it's not a guarantee of it. It's a sign. It's a seal. A seal in what way? 
I think the phrase seal concerns God rather than any experience in us. The seal means a guarantee. It relates to the promises of God of forgiveness to all who believe. His guarantee to keep his word. In baptism, we think of his promises to us and to our children. In the Lord's Supper, we think of his promises of grace. In that way, the sacraments are a seal to us, the assurance to us of the grace of God to sinners who believe in Jesus. So while the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper do not communicate saving grace to us, they communicate strengthening grace as we think of them as signs and seals of his redemption. My children, they they love the point in the, the, the wedding ceremony where I say, you may now kiss the bride. You know, and, and to some people, you know, this is, this is a low point. Uh, this is, you know, this is an, you know, a, a distraction from the, the solemnity of, of what's going on. You may, you may now kiss the bride and everyone gets excited and embarrassed and taking photos and all the rest. But actually, as we reflect on this tonight, perhaps it's the high point. B- because there it's, it's giving us an insight into the sacraments and God's grace towards us. Because in, 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 in marriage, there, there is the sign of the ring, the sign of endless love, that, that visible, tangible element it placed on, onto the finger, which is the, the sign of the, the commitment and, and the vows that are made and, and will always be a sign for the husband and for the wife. The sign is there of promised love. But then there's the seal. The seal of the kiss. The physical contact. The expression. The assurance. The evidence. The guarantee of love. As we think of the sacraments, the visibility of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Not only are they signs, but we touch them. We feel them. They are seals. They are guarantees. There, there's something more there. There's something additional there. There's another layer there than, than the sign. There's this seal of the love of God towards us. So we don't ignore the sacraments. Yes, they are not essential for our salvation, but we don't ignore them. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, they're not the source of saving grace, but they are the source, sources of strengthening grace. And our church code allows for home communion. For any elderly person who with good reason cannot be present at the Lord's Supper, elders can take communion to their home so that they can receive and experience that strengthening means of grace. Let us not misunderstand the sacraments. We're to perceive their proper role within Jesus' church And within our lives, in the 256-piece toolkit by Vaughan House, there's a tool for every purpose. For every DIY role in your house, there's a tool in that 256-piece toolkit. No use in taking the hacksaw to put in a nail. The proper tool needs to be used for the proper job. And so within the church, it's faith that brings salvation. The sacrament's role is not to save us, it's to strengthen us.